Welcome to the Bob Allen Healthcast number 295. Many psychological and psychiatric illnesses are not in your head, but in your hormones. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. We just returned from a medical conference of the Age Management Medicine Group, and we heard some things there that are uncomfortable for me to talk about because my training is different from what I'm now learning. And my approach to understanding some of these things is different from what I'm now learning. And what was interesting to me as was it, at this conference, so many of those physicians who were talking in, in conversational clusters and the presenters were saying the same thing. We have learned some things that we didn't learn in school that our approach to understanding and treating was not formulated at school. And we have had to grow and change. And growth and change is a good thing, but it's an uncomfortable thing. It's exhausting. So today we're going to talk about growth and change in terms of our understanding of psychological and psychiatric illnesses as not being characterological, right. not being parentally caused not being caused by lack of willpower. We're talking about things like OCD, depression, anxiety, generalized anxiety, bipolar disorder, things like that. There's new research and information that's out there that's causing me, at least, to reframe my understanding of the causality behind those illnesses and the treatment protocols for those illnesses mm -hmm. in ways that would help my patients. And, and I'm excited about that, but I'm frustrated because I didn't know it before. <laughs> and and so, and so you feel bad that yeah. if you had that knowledge, you could have helped this Dif person help differently. a different yeah. way, and they would have gotten better faster. That would be my hope. But, but, the, but the, over, the overall, I guess we'll talk, I think you can talk about the overall view that used to be. Yeah. And then, but, but oh, this. Oh, I know that, reflexively. <laughs> yeah, but this overall, the overall view that is new and well accepted in many countries and mm. now is being presented here as new information thousands and thousands of studies to back them up is that all of these psychiatric diseases that you mentioned have a hormonal basis that oftentimes the people that get these illnesses, they have, they always have a genetic, a genetic kind of risk for this, but that doesn't mean you're going to get it if you have a genetic risk. But then if your testosterone drops, if your cortisol goes up, if your estrogen drops, if your, um, let's see, oh, thyroid, if your thyroid is off, then, and they're not treated, well, then it's very hard to treat these, these illnesses. These things can drop or be off because of the aging process. Mm -hmm. They can drop or be off because of traumatic brain injury. Right. Uh, there are multiple causes. Post-traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress. Yes. I mean, going, going to Iraq or Afghanistan and coming home yeah, can give you what is like having a brain injury. Even if you weren't hit, it's the same process and that can shut down all your hormones. And so most of our information that we're going to be sharing with you today comes from a talk that was given by Dr. Mark Gordon. And Dr. Gordon has written a book called Traumatic Brain Injury. We're not in this conversation going to be focusing on TBI, but we're going to be focusing on what he had to say as he's treating more and more TBI uh, victims, particularly military and athletic, that he's discovering, he and other uh, doctors and researchers, uh, all of the hormonal changes that occur, and that by treating those hormonal changes to restore normal values, right. that there can be positive occurrences uh, in terms of healing that don't require psychotropic drugs that have massive side effects mm -hmm. and are so limited and are so expensive. The hormonal treatments are fairly inexpensive. Mm -hmm. The psychotropic drugs are phenomenally expensive. He works with the military and he saves the military a lot of money. And he saves a lot of people's 
lives in terms of quality of life and return to normal function. So, so the basic the basic idea that we're going to be discussing in d- detail with with especially depression because mm-hmm. that's the most common psychiatric illness uh, is that hormone deficiency is the the foundation excuse me of getting these diseases and if we can replace the hormones then it's much easier to manage neurotransmitters mm-hmm. Horm- and that hormones do cross the blood brain barrier into your brain and you do have an effect of, uh, on the neurotransmitters like you've heard of serotonin norepinephrine dopamine epinephrine so all of those are in your our neurotransmitters or communicators in your brain and all your hormones that cross through then affect those levels. Those levels are what make us feel happy or sad or give us Parkinson's if we don't have enough dopamine. Well, he also says estrogen. I mean, I mean, it's a whole cluster of testosterone, thyroid, estrogen. And, Cortisol. And he says that estrogen has, uh, let me quote it correctly, that has properties similar to those of atypical antipsychotic drugs used in treatment of schizophrenia. So by regulating estrogen amounts, you can get some of the gains that you get from anti-schizophrenic drugs, right. but without the cost and without the side effects. So that said to me, if I have someone who's a patient yeah. who has schizophrenia and he's male, mm-hmm. I need to allow him to have, I don't want to wipe out his estrogen. Right. I, I don't want to give him so much Arimidex that he has none. Mm-hmm. I want to leave some estrogen in there because men make estrogen and not try to treat it. So that's what it says to me because I'm the treating physician. Mm-hmm. Patients don't always have to know all this, but it's nice if you do know this because then you know what your doctor's trying to do. It helps helps you comply with their wishes. Right. So that you don't go, oh, I'm tired of, you know, having this I, I I've got a little bit of fat right here. And so I want to get rid of all my estrogen. Well, if you're schizophrenic or depressed, not a good idea. Right. So I would have to say, no, I don't think that's great. We're, we're going to decrease your dose and then allow you to have some. It may not at first look great, but it will later, mm-hmm. you know, and it makes a huge difference in mood. So, so well, and, and that's one of the issues in, in treating depression and anxiety and schizophrenia in, in the mood fluctuations and the mood control drugs that do have such serious side effects. Right. I mean, most most of my patients who come in with, three antidepressants or anti like a bipolar med and two antidepressants that come in, even when I give them adequate or high normal testosterone doses, they still either can't orgasm or don't have a sex drive because they counter the neurotransmitters that are produced by testosterone. So they're countering what actually would make this patient better. What we do is not take them off all their drugs, but look to which drug affects testosterone neurotransmitters the most, and then decrease their dose with their psychiatrist. Well, and that is one of the challenges, and it's not a new challenge by any means, of medicine. How do you get a team approach or a collegial approach to Mm -hmm. the treatment of some of these illnesses and disorders, to the treatment of people? for the treatment of people that have symptoms that cause distress in their lives. Mm-hmm. And if doctors will talk to each other, respect one another's focus and knowledge, mm-hmm. and you know something that I don't know, mm-hmm. I'm treating this patient, and you benefit me with the information that you have, am I receptive to that or am I dismissive? Do I think I know everything or I know what I was trained to do in mm-hmm. school many years ago? One of the things that we heard over and over again at the conference that we attended from the presenters was that doctors internalize thought modes. It's like set scripts when they go to school. And unless something dramatic comes along to change that, they, they automate it. And then when they encounter a case of it 20, 30, 40 years later, their mind goes back to what they were taught in school. And so that's the answer. And if there's new information, <laughs> new medicine, and somebody says, doc, 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 we got a better, faster, easier way, they're, they're resistant to that in many cases. And they, they've actually gone back and, and looked at what's the backup for what we were taught in school? Right. Like, right. what's the backup for saying testosterone causes prostate cancer? Right. Well, three patients. Right. That's it. 
So there was that, a, there was a study that was heavily quoted, and the doctors has learned still in been, school. They're still quoted, and and the, the author of the study won the Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> and now they've gone back and looked at the actual study, and the population was three patients. And, and when you really get down inside the study, one patient mm -hmm. that they made the conclusions from, and the conclusions that they drew didn't match the data that they had, and they can now find that. So the study should be thrown out, but. The medical schools are still teaching it. The doctors still cite it. They still believe it. And it's like politics. If you say the same lie over and over and over again, people believe it. And so even doctors succumb to that. They say the same. They've been told this as truth, mm -hmm. and they believe it unless they're given the information that proves that it that that's not true. So right. for me, no. So I'm gonna I'm gonna confess. I would, when we're replacing iodine, which is very necessary to be replaced, and we have iodorol, which is a combination iodine and some other type of iodine, uh, potassium iodide. So we offer it to patients, but we're like, mm, just take half, you know, because, because they all learn not to do salt. You know, salt will cause high blood pressure, you have a heart attack, you'll die, get off salt. Right. And you need salt to absorb potassium. So what I didn't do is, I didn't know that. I wasn't trained with that, that salt and, and potassium have to be taken together. Right. But what I did remember was somewhere in the back of my mind, you can't take too much iodine. It'll shut your thyroid down. Right. Okay. So that was what I was taught in medical school. My nurse practitioner said, why? Dr. Brownstein, who's the expert in iodine, says, you need to take a whole lot more than what we're giving our patients. Right. And because in my mind, that was a truth. And then he he gave a lecture and went through all the studies that show that we are under iodized. Mm -hmm. It does not shut your thyroid down. It actually, it's kind of like what the prostate does with testosterone. Iodine needs to fill your thyroid with iodine until, and then when you're done with that, you're starting to pee it off. Mm -hmm. So you get rid of what you don't need. So iodine levels don't really matter. But once you once you start peeing it off in a twenty four hour urine, then your dose you're is you're, you're saturated, and then you can decrease the dose a little bit. Right. But that's I succumbed to that, and I've been I had been saying it up until this conference, and then when I saw the data, I apologized to my nurses. I said I've been telling you this, and yeah. it was from medical school forty years You've ago. You've been telling me I'm the doctor. This is what I want. <laughs> well, they, they asked me. Yeah, they asked. You know, right? And so, I, but I couldn't give them backup. Yeah. So I've done it as well. Some things just you think you remember from way back when as a truth. Well, one of the things that Dr. Gordon had to say, and you were talking about depression. He says mm -hmm. depression is a common illness currently treated with counseling and SSRIs liberally. Yet the hormonal source of the depression is overlooked. Depression has been found to be secondary to inflammation of the brain, high cortisol levels, low thyroid levels, low testosterone levels, insufficient growth hormone, and low dopamine. So if you can supply those things cheaper and more naturally than an artificial antipsychotic drug or an antidepressant drug, then you're costing less money. You're doing better medicine. People are getting better. They feel normal. And they don't feel like as they don't have any emotions. Right. No. And as a group, they don't know that. I think we're 10 to 15 years ahead of maybe. They're nibbling. But it's in the medical journals. It's yeah. not like this is hidden somewhere. No one seems to be reading it mm -hmm. or embracing it. Or they they just look at it and go, eh. I mean, I don't know why they they don't do something with this. It's in our journals. Well, another thing that I heard, and it's in the journals and it's in some of the presentations, but standing around the conversational clusters at the convention, is I heard people talking about uh, human growth hormone and the fact that it has so many positively potential uses, mm -hmm. but it is anathema. They, they have been so regulated and advised against it. By our and, government that we pay with our tax dollars. <laughs> and why, We're restricted. And why is the question that I, I kept hear, uh, her, I kept hearing being asked. If you why know how to use, use it, it, it's like any other drug. If you know how to use it, right. then you can use it well, and it will be potentially a good thing. Why it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Dangerous by the FDA, which is what they call it. A dangerous drug. A dangerous drug. And why they control it like it's a narcotic or something that is, is um, I, can't, I can't even think of the word. You become ad addictive. Mm -hmm. That I don't understand that, but why they control testosterone, I don't understand either. It's a way of, of 
keeping us from replacing the hormones we need. And somehow somebody thought it was, it was protecting patients when in fact, all the people who are older, who don't have enough growth hormone, maybe because they've had a head injury, maybe because they've had PTSD, but I, I usually get it back for my patients with testosterone, but not everybody does that. I need to have some growth hormone for those people because they don't think right. They don't feel right. They don't have normal activity levels. They, they are not feeling well and other things start to fall when they, you know, they start to look old and they start to get osteoporosis. It, there's a lot of things that are hooked to growth hormone. So, so then the question is medically, we understand that it would be useful and is needful, but we can't get it politically because the regulatory agency says it is forbidden because it is dangerous and that's all you need to know. You can only use it in children. And, and so the question is, why? Who benefits? You know, always ask the question, who benefits? Where's the money? Uh, politicians benefit because they maintain a scare tactic that mm -hmm. supports the agenda of the people that pay the money. And the people that pay the money is Big Pharma. Because without growth hormones. can't make hormone, money off the growth hormones because they're natural substances. Well, they can make money, but well, not growth hormone, money. if they take testosterone, mm -hmm. if somebody takes testosterone, they have all their hormones replaced, they need very few other drugs. So we're taking them all, you know, so right. Big Pharma is not really trying to keep you healthy. Big Pharma is trying to keep you on the most drugs possible in America, and they've achieved that because each drug is for a different symptom, but never are we are they proposing we fix the cause. So yes, the cause is aging, we can't fix that, but we can fix the next step, which is loss of our hormones that then makes us need all these other drugs. If we fix the hormones, eh, the drugs may go away. Blood pressure comes down, diabetes goes away. All the things that I'm so proud of in our practice right. that people stop having dementia. I mean, people who have started to lose their mind come back and they start at least freeze in place. They don't lose more of it. Well, some of them, I some mean, the guys recovery. that have had yeah. head injuries, the football players and stuff that right. have had head injuries and have aged and now are unable to think of words. I can see them change in four months. Right. I mean, it's a big difference. It's, it is so dramatic. I wish I would have videotaped them mm -hmm. at the beginning yeah. and because looking for words and looking and feeling old after a hundred concussions, <laughs> which is what this one gentleman told me. And then the next time, I mean, he came in, couldn't even speak he, well, or in a sentence, but the next time he came in, he's telling me jokes and he's got an affect and I'm like, and the difference was testosterone. And that was it. Testosterone, but his growth hormone came up as well. So in explaining this, you sometimes use a plumbing analogy. We yeah, I, I, I like to use that again. Yeah. Not that I'm a plumber, but they used to call gynecologists that. Um, plumbing is something everybody's dealt with. So if you have, say you have a plumbing backup, none of your drains work, and you know, or maybe you don't know, that it's from the trees in your front yard growing into the pipe that takes it out to the, the common drain, or it's somebody capped it off. So it's backing up and it's causing you trouble. Well, some people would just say, mm, it's probably just hair in my, in my sink. Well, maybe it's hair too. Mm -hmm. They take the hair out of their sink and it drains down a little bit, okay? They've relieved the problem of backing up into the room for now, right? but it, there's still no place to go. So when we look so at this- So you treat the visible sign the, the visible problem, sign- Which don't solve the problem. Is like giving you a whole bunch of drugs. Right. And it's, it visibly gets a little better, but the next time you try to use your sink and you fill up, fill it up with water, it's going to back up again because you didn't fix the real problem. So then there's another drug. So, so you have to fix the real problem. And that's what fixing hormones is for these things. Well, it's amazing how many different, how many changes the example you that can Dr. Attack with this. uses is depression. Right. And he says 61% of the people that are diagnosed with a growth hormone deficiency are suffering from depression and are receiving medicines to treat the depression. Right. And that if they are instead given growth hormone, the depression goes away. So downstream, what we're doing is selling antidepressants and then uh, adjuster adapter medicines. And anti-anxiety and sleep medicine. So we're selling because, six pills yeah. instead of one. Right. And, and that's the irony. And that everyone at this 
conference for the very first time right. had caught up to our indignation at not having freedom We've been saying this in Madison. I mean, I have a, a sad but true mm -hmm. anger that our government impairs our ability to be really well, healthy, because it is... It's funded by taxpayers, but it is run by pharma, pharmaceutical company executives, money, lobbyists. I mean, it isn't the tails wagging the dog. And they talk about money. Oh, it costs too much, too much to get sick in America. Mm -hmm. our, that means our insurance um, fees go up. And, and then the government's monetary allotment for uh, medicine goes up. So what do they do? They cut the pay to doctors. Yeah. Because we aren't like an organized group. Well, we can't organize. You're the one that's failing in solving the problem. Well, all, if you, all you give somebody... Just because we've tied your hands behind your back. No. If all you give somebody is a hammer, when, when, they've, when they have a plumbing issue, then you can't fix the problem. Well, that's called the law of the hammer. Actually, there's a term for it in psychology. <laughs> what it means is if you give a three-year-old a hammer, everything is a nail. Right. So... <laughs> But but we're trying to we're going to talk about some specifics on which hormones help and which supplements help. Right. And 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 that's it, it's amazing what we learned about uh, both schizophrenia, depression. We've talked about depression a little bit, mania, anxiety, OCD, and bipolar disorder, and it included testosterone, which we know helps all of those disorders, and estrogen in women, but it also includes other hormones and other supplements that we can use to treat that if we know. You can ask your, your psychiatrist. I'm taking, the, I'm taking this book to my psychiatrist who does my ADD. Everyone needs a psychiatrist. Anyway, um, but I'm going to take it and ask him to read it because I think this is valid treatment for so many things that we get halfway better, like bipolar disorder, treat you with drugs you hate. Right. So we get halfway better and stop taking the drugs. I mean, whoever has that, I don't have that, but I mean, whoever takes it. So if we could treat the real problem and, and make it go away. Well, the conclusion that so many of these presenters helpful. Was, were making, we summarized in this statement, the hormones that should be replaced if low. When you have been diagnosed with depression, schizophrenia, mania, anxiety, OCD, bipolar illness, include testosterone in both sexes, estradiol in women, growth hormone, thyroid, cortisol, pregnenolone, DHEA, and progesterone. And if you replace those hormones, in many, many cases, there's a significant improvement that doesn't then require the antipsychotic and psychotropic drugs that are so expensive and have so many side effects. So maybe if you are interested in this topic or if you have people that suffer from these disorders, you need to have this discussion with your physician and ask him to take a look at uh, Dr. Gordon's book, uh, Traumatic Brain Injury, which is a, a new publication, mm -hmm. but he, he can find it if he wants to. And they, can, and they can look at our blog, which is a little bit more detailed than uh, this video, or they can listen to our video. But I mean, right. this is, that's why the information is out there, is for you to be better in every area and to spread the word to your to your doctor nicely, 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 calmly, because you know they may never have heard this before because they haven't been reading that kind of that kind of that literature. That particular journal, right? Specialty. So we we want you to share. That's our that's our a ask for you to share. And if you've already been made better by doing these things, then write a testimonial. Send it to your congresswoman. Send it send it to your congressman. Send it to you know it. It is necessary to get this information up the ladder so that we can say we're mad as and we're not going to take it anymore. And you guys need to change the system. Thank you very much. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. 
Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.